Well, hello again, everyone. Thank you for attending our third webinar in this series. We really appreciate you uh, returning. We have good uh, turnout again. I'd like to start by doing a land acknowledgement that our offices are located on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation, ancestral lands with the Algonquin and uh, Anishinaabe people. Uh, this is going to be recorded, this webinar. So uh, right afterwards, we put it on YouTube. Then uh, I'll be sharing the link tomorrow with the follow-up survey. So if you, you know, some scheduling-wise don't uh, get a chance to see it or they want to share it with their colleagues, so that's appreciated. Um, we also have a the follow-up survey, as I mentioned, and that really helps us, you know, understand you know, for the, the better to improve the material and the uh, the the next series of webinars. So this one has a question of what you would like to learn more about for the next webinar. And um, yeah, as we build this community of practice, it's exciting to just see the power of of the different organizations across the country working on this. Like it's really inspiring to to hear their stories. And and I hope with the next series of webinars, you know, even going into to next fall that. Uh, that you hear these stories as well, because, you know, we know, we all know how depressing our work can be. And it's nice to, you know, hear those positive stories. So uh, I want to keep that going to put more of the solutions into the nature based solutions. And um, so, um, yeah, and then um, what has come out of the surveys is leave more time for Q&A afterwards. So uh, when we had this chat with uh, Michelle and Katrina, we you know shortened the presentation a bit. So there's more time for questions, answers afterwards. Um, so our, I'll start with our first presenter, which is Michelle Lewis from is the natural asset technician from the town of Gibsons. A municipality at the forefront of natural asset management work. Her role is unique to Gibsons, a position dedicated solely to monitoring, maintaining, and planning around Gibsons natural assets. She is a ISA certified arborist and holds a master's degree in urban forestry and leadership. Her work to date with Gibsons includes water shed scale project, which looks to ensure the natural assets within the town's entire watershed are understood, measured value, and ultimately managed to ensure their health. The project follows on the heels of Gibson's Coastal Resilient Project, which focused on the role of natural assets in mitigating the risk to communities in the face of climate crisis. While other, well, Many other local governments are already accounting for natural assets. They're doing so from an environmental or sustainability lens, whereas Gibson's natural asset technician ensures natural assets are woven through every single department, including their financial building and planning departments. Michelle's role reflects the town's commitment to integrate natural asset management into decision-making, planning, and operations. So as you can see, we picked the right person to be presenting this information uh, to you all today. So uh, with that, I know we a little patience here when we uh, figure out how to upload to Zoom. So uh, over to you, Michelle. Okay. Good so I'm far. the right one? Okay. Perfect. Great. Okay, thanks, Paul. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, like you said, my name is Michelle Lewis. Uh, I live and work in Chequelp, which is now known as, or currently known as the town of Gibsons on the west coast of British Columbia. I've worked for the town of Gibsons for uh, about seven years and it's been almost four years in this current role. And today I just wanted to talk through what it's like to, um, to work with nature-based solutions uh, in a municipal setting. So I'll talk a little bit about a project that I just wrapped up, as well as some ongoing. Let's see if I can advance. Go. Okay, so I know uh, in the previous speaker uh, series you spoke with, or you had Joanna from Intact Center and University of Waterloo, and Roy Brook from Natural Assets Initiative. So I work pretty closely with the two of them on um, nature-based solution and natural asset management. Um, and so what I wanna 
really highlight today is how we've taken this this to, um, and adopted it as an approach to how we do all of our operations within the town. Um, so it's not just building nature-based solutions or using them, it's about uh, valuing nature and integrating it into all aspects of our organization. So in 2020, uh, I began work with the Natural Assets Initiative on a project that we called From Source to Sea, which is an aquifer 560, which is the aquifer on which we pull all of our drinking water um, and the watershed protection and management area. So what we were looking to identify was the role of the natural assets um, and the potential future roles of these assets um, to quantify the value and the strategies for effective management in the watershed. So the interesting part about natural assets obviously is that they don't follow jurisdictional boundaries, that um, the image that you see on the screen there, the highlighted area is the aquifer recharge area and the town of Gibsons is only a small portion of that. Um, so through this project, what we were looking to do is to identify all of the natural assets. So forest riparian areas, water or um, wetlands, stormwater, ponds, creeks, foreshore uh, within the natural asset or sorry, within the watershed area. And then look at um, their condition, then do a risk assessment following the asset management um, strategies, and then look at valuation of natural assets. And I'll clarify that, and I think Joanna probably spoke about this in the last series, that when we're looking at valuing um, nature, we're looking at the valuing the services they provide, not nature itself. Uh, through that project too, we looked at, we did stormwater modeling and um, that modeling was to, to look at uh, effects of human activities within the watershed and what we would need, what, um, what engineered or bioengineered uh, infrastructure we would have to put in to, to deal with the um, additional runoff if we were to decrease forest cover. We also looked at uh, integration of varying models that we have currently within the watershed. So we have an aquifer model, we have uh, coastal models, uh, and then we have stormwater modeling and looking at how all three of those could speak to each other, looking at like precipitation, infiltration, um, potential salt water intrusion, impacts of high tides on the aquifer. Uh, and then the, the final, project through the source to see was to build a tech or like a technical roadmap for other municipalities to undertake the same work in their communities. So this just wrapped up in the last couple of weeks um, and the report will be coming out probably late April. And obviously will be shared with everyone. So as I mentioned, we have uh, we have an aquifer underneath the town of Gibsons. The image on the right shows the entire watershed again. And then that bright blue area that some say look like an orca, some think looks like a dove, is a is the aquifer and how it's how it is the the extent of it underneath the town of Gibsons and that um, surrounding areas. And so you can see that impacts to the aquifer are um, outside of our own jurisdictional boundaries. And so we so we need to look at aligning with the surrounding areas um, for like development permit areas protection and uh, riparian protection, um, looking at wellhead protection, looking at um, like land use and zoning. Uh, and the image on the left just kind of shows you where the creeks would be coming through and uh, how they cut into that confining layer of the aquifer. So this approach, looking at modeling and um, modeling and uh, monitoring in the watershed is really important to, to ensure that we're maintaining the integrity of the aquifer. So in the next slide, I'll kind of get into what we do as far as protection. Um, so in 2021 to 20, to current, we've installed additional monitoring wells um, down in Lower Gibsons, which kind of which will show us when we're pumping our our wells 
or operational wells, um, what the impact could be on the creek water. Because as you saw in that previous slide, the creeks in size. And so um, there's areas that potentially the creek is charging the aquifer or the aquifer is charging the creek. And there's that hydraulic connection between those two bodies of water. And um, so through uh, this flow accretion study that, um, that we did, in 2023, we were looking at areas of high potential for um, for infiltration, and that would inform management decisions moving forward on how do we protect those areas um, more strongly. Uh, we also looked at these precip precipitation and temperature stations, which you can see on the screen there, um, which will show us, you know, where we have high higher precipitation um, accumulation precipitation events, like what the disparity is within the watershed and understanding where those infiltration areas are and correlating the two. And then we're also working on a, what we call the watershed management area plan or a one water strategy with our, our neighboring jurisdictions to um, align all of our policies and, and our, and kind of double up on the monitoring um, work that, that the town has started. And finally, because I'm cognizant of time, I'm not sure how I'm doing here, probably 10 minutes in. Okay. So <clears throat> this, uh, in 2021, I had a, an assessment done of a creek that runs through, like it's entirely within the town of Gibsons, um, starts in Upper Gibsons and out to the ocean, and it runs through multiple residential properties, as you can see on the screen here. The assessment was looking at creek health through like benthic invertebrates and looked at temperature, looked at um, water quality, uh, looked at riparian vegetation. And um, the project uh, showed that this, just in this one reach of the creek, there were multiple um, barriers to fish passage and also uh, multiple like areas where we had invasive species, we had concreted weirs, um, and this was just, you know, historical um, channeling of the creek that was done, we're assuming probably in the 1950s. And so after doing that assessment, um, I applied for a grant through, dang, I should have remembered. Um, I applied through a grant and got uh, six million, oh, did my screen just go? There we go. Um, we got $6 million to do restoration of this creek and a smaller creek that's just to the south of this. And uh, and this was the first time I feel like we were able to put language such as natural assets into a grant application and were successful. So it was pretty groundbreaking for us um, because typically grant applications that you know we're that are made available to local governments they talk about um they talk about asset renewal or um tangible capital assets uh which is something that we're working on having nature or natural assets be considered as part of those and so uh it was an interesting experience because i i feel like i i talked a lot about like culvert replacement in the grant application but i was really trying to highlight the naturalization of the creek and the restoration of that as a natural system um and i was kind of concerned that i wasn't going to get the grant because of that and we were successful so that was really exciting um and i we have been working on this for the past year we're in preliminary design stage and um I'm interested to hear Katrina speak next because my experience so far, like in the year of doing this is that um, we work with civil engineers, geotechnical, hydro hydrogeological and um, structural engineers on this project and qualified environmental professionals, but we don't have, I don't have the boots on the ground folks to help me with this project. So, you know, we, we work with stream keepers, um, the Sunshine Coast Stream Keepers Association Society, and uh, but their their capacity is quite limited here because we're a fairly small town with and there's lots of creeks around this area. Um, so 
I think it's going to be a fascinating project. Um, and, and it would be great if we could have volunteers come out and like help us with that component of like, you know, with the knowledge of, of, uh, historical projects. The other piece on this, this is kind of the last thing I'll say is that, um, we have been, because we're on Squamish territory, we are building a really strong relationship with the nation and um, we've reached out to them about this project and they seem quite excited about it. And when we've done other Creek work, they have actually sent over like a junior uh, ACE monitor, which is like archeological, cultural and environmental monitor to come and do that, like the infiltration study that we did. And they came and walked alongside our our consultants to do the work. So we're hoping that this is going to be a way of restoring the creek back to as close to natural as possible, given the constraints of the sites. Um, and I think I'm going to leave it there. I am excited for after Katrina's talk to answer any questions that anybody might have. So thanks very much. Back to you, Paul. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. I, uh, yeah, I personally found that very interesting and and uh it's it's going to be nice to see the synergy with uh with Katrina and yourselves and, and how they they fit together uh, there, and there's already a question um in the chat so uh Penny this one is for Michelle but we'll if you don't mind if you can put your questions in the Q&A box and then we'll get to them uh as they were submitted uh, afterwards uh it's it's nice as well Michelle you you mentioned about getting volunteers uh, working on these historical projects. And, and that really is, you know, my mandate here at Nature Canada is to, you know, build those bridges between the groups, uh, you know, the different nature groups and uh, conservation groups to be working with municipalities. Because you know, uh, the folks that I've met are just amazing, the, the knowledge that they have, if it's pollination or if it's, uh, you know, wetlands. It's just, there's such a knowledge there that, um, you know, to build those synergies to help build a better community so uh yeah looking forward to to seeing and you know the folks on on the on the call here or on the webinar on, on just how they can work with their municipalities as well so i hope that the material that michelle presented today uh you know just shows you you know the linkages with the uh the groups on the ground and the municipality and we'll learn more about this uh with katrina who is our second presenter and I don't think she's wearing rubber boots right now, but she, you can see behind she has uh, the nets. And so, as I was saying, I was, you know, when I kind of came up with this idea of the webinars, I wanted to go high up. And that was, you know, the two professors from UBC and, and uh, Ottawa U talking about, uh, you know, the twin crisis, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis. And I wanted to keep bringing it down, down, down. So now we're with Katrina, we're in the stream. So it's, I'm trying to connect it as much as possible to the participants on this call so that you can see, you know, these synergies. And, uh, you know, I hope as I build this community of practice with the professionals like yourselves across the country, uh, that, uh, you know, we have lots of examples to go from. So Katrina Adams is a registered professional biologist and a senior aquatic biologist at Peninsula Streams and Shorelines, a nonprofit organization dedicated to watershed conservation in greater Victoria. She has been working with PSS for almost three years, but has a wide range of experience in ecology from lake water quality monitoring Quebec, studying genetic evolution of Arctic char in Iceland, and monitoring coral reef health, coral reef health in Australia. Uh, dove on the Great Bay Reef. Um, and at Peninsula Streams, Katrina's primary focus is in stream restoration and working towards revitalizing urban ecosystems to improve habitat for salmon and other wildlife through community-driven restoration and stewardship. Other important aspects of Katrina's work is fostering partnerships with First Nations, all levels of government and other local organizations to contribute, to collectively contribute to the restoration and preservation of aquatic habitats and the enhancement of our urban watersheds. So over to you, Ms. Adams. And again, thank you very much for uh, being part of this. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, thanks so much for having me speak here today. I am really excited to be part of this webinar series. Uh, really excited to hear about your projects, Michelle, and definitely feeds well into what I'll be speaking to you about today. Um, I'm just going to share my slides here. Okay. Um, 
Is that all right? Everyone can see that all right? Um, Not yet. Nope. Okay. All good. We've all <laughs> we've all been through this. Sorry about that. Yeah, let's no problem at all. There we go. Good. Okay. All good. Perfect. Um okay, let's Um, all right, so I'll just like to start off with saying that I am uh, speaking to you today from the unceded territories of the Lekwungen and Wasanich peoples. And um, so I'm speaking from the, the greater Victoria area, essentially, is what my project base is, um, is out of. And my talk today, I'd like to talk about sort of restoration and nature-based solutions in a highly urbanized environment. So Kind of moving from Michelle's talk, I'd like to kind of focus really in on uh, specific projects that we've been able to um, implement here in the Victoria region, um, and then kind of the successes and challenges that we've had in working in such an urbanized area, and then the key uh, key reasons why these projects have been a success and mostly around partnerships. Um, it's going okay. So just a quick, real quick background about Peninsula Streams, just to give you a sort of sense of the kind of work that we do. So we are a nonprofit based out of Great Victoria, and we've been working in the area since 2002. Our main goals and our mandate really is to improve local ecosystems through community stewardship, uh, environmental education, mostly in schools, as well as habitat restoration. And that's around stream restoration, shoreline restoration, and then um, expanding into marshes and wetlands and other ecosystems as well. One of the key reasons why we're able to do so much work, we're just a small team of about seven full-time staff, um, is our extensive partnerships. And I'll talk about those in just a sec, as well as our high volunteerism. So we rely on a huge amount of very dedicated and passionate volunteers in all of Greater Victoria. We have about 150 active volunteers working on all our projects, and um, we definitely could not do the work that we do without our volunteers. And um, I, th I think it's a very mutual relationship where we get a lot of great work done with them, but they also really benefit from getting their hands dirty and getting the streams with us. So with our partnerships, um, we have a wide variety of different ones that we've um, developed over the many years we've been working in the area. Um, one of the big ones that really get a lot of work done is with our municipalities. So Victoria is within the Capital Regional District. Uh, so it's made up of 13 different municipalities and we have developed a relationship with 10 of them. Some of these come from, or some of these are made up of um, funding. So we get some funding from municipalities to do work within that municipality, but others we've developed a much closer knit relationship where we work together on the planning, the conceiving planning and then implementing of restoration projects within their municipalities. And um, other relationships and partnerships with the First Nations, the local First Nations, this is a really important one and one that we're working on uh, improving um, and making sure that we are creating this strong partnership um, when we're working in the territories of the, the local First Nations here. Uh, we work with other governmental bodies, so uh, province of BC scientists of various departments, the Environment Canada and DFO as well for federal uh, governmental bodies. And then a big one is with working uh, closely with other community groups and NGOs. There's a lot of community groups that are working towards the same goal, working here. And when we combine our forces, particularly with funding and other resources, we can get a lot done. And where Peninsula Streams really comes in is that we kind of act as an umbrella group and sort of uh, support 15 other stewardship groups. So those are mostly smaller volunteer run um, friends of groups. So those friends of specific parks or watersheds or our stream. We support them by providing them with equipment, uh, training and expertise in restoration projects, as well as linking them up with municipalities. So sort of being a bridge between volunteer, smaller volunteer groups and the larger municipalities. Um, may not all be familiar with the Victoria area, but essentially uh, the map on the right is the Saanich Peninsula, which connects with the greater Victoria 
um, and Langford um, West Shore area, which is the map on the left. So they kind of stack on top of each other. Um, but the yellow outlines represent the watersheds that we're currently working in. So quite a, quite a wide range. There's about six or seven. And then the red dots represent all the project sites that we're working on right now. Uh, so again, quite a range of stream restorations as well as sh a shoreline restoration and rain garden sites as well, which are all projects. Um, I'll be sort of giving you a little highlight of each of those types of ecosystems that we're working in. Uh, so one of the big ones that I've really been involved with is in a stream restoration project of the Colquitts River watershed. The Colquitts watershed is one of the bigger, highly urbanized watersheds within the, the Capital Regional District here. Um, and as you can see in the map here, which is, shows the land use cover um, of the watershed, it is highly modified. So all that red represents buildings, roads, and, and other impervious surfaces. And the Colquitts River is about 15 kilometers and flows essentially straight through all that red. So it's highly modified stream. Um, it was historically dredged um, from agricultural practices and then uh, later on development. So major loss of all the natural substrates. So mostly rock um, is all gone, as well as large wood, which is really important for salmon habitat. Because of all those impervious surfaces, there's a lot of storm runoff, which brings in toxin and contaminants. So we're dealing with a lot of poor water quality issues in the Colquitts. And then of course, with development uh, and urbanization, loss of riparian vegetation. So we have this sort of thin riparian corridor left along the Colquitts, but much of it is dominated by invasive species. Um, and it's quite thin, so we're getting a lot of impacts of um, stream temperature increasing as we don't have enough tree cover. Um, so despite all those awful imp issues that we're dealing with, and there's a lot of them, we still have a pretty good salmon population within the Colquitts. We're not getting thousands of salmon, but you know, every year we're getting about 400, 500 coho um, salmon coming to spawn. And that's pretty good considering how urbanized and how many issues we're dealing with. So uh, really important to try and protect this ecosystem for the salmon, of course, and all the other wildlife that rely on salmon as well. Um, and because of the salmon population, um, you know, there are a lot of groups working to try and protect and restore the Colquitts watershed. And one of the big ones is the municipality that the Colquitts is within, and that's the district of Saanich. And we have developed a really close relationship with Saanich over the last decade. Um, and um, in the last three years alone, we've restored about 500 meters. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot of work. Um, about 500 meters of the Colquitts um, to recreate as best we can um, high quality salmon habitat. So it's been a really successful partnership so far, and we've got lots of plans for the future. We just completed an assessment as well, similar to what Michelle was talking about, and have created a really great priority list, almost like a shopping list of uh, restoration projects to really create a um, more connected um, corridor of high quality salmon habitat. So one of the projects that I was uh, really closely involved with um, in, in the designing of it was one uh, within Copley Park, which is a large park in Saanich. So it's kind of, you could see that green, the treed area is the Copley Park and the Colquitts River flows right through it. Each of these rectangles, colored rectangles represent a different year of restoration. The turquoise at the top was done in 2019, the middle one in 2020, and then this orange one here was one that I helped to design and implement with Saanich in 2022. And it was about um, 110 meters or so that we did in 2022. So just some of the work that we did, um, as I mentioned, you know, it was uh, the Colquitts was dredged. So a big piece is trying to bring back in natural sediments mostly rock is the big one that's missing. There was no spawning habitat, so no gravel available for salmon, no real boulders or um, cobble that is important for invertebrates and fish food essentially, very, very little in-stream cover. So um, essentially it's a complex, complex habitat. So often you'd like to see big pieces of wood or big boulders that uh, fish could hide under against their predators. 
So we try to rec recreate those as best we can working within the constraints of an urban environment. So we're adding large, big cedar stumps. You can see in the photo on the bottom left here with a machine, we're adding that in. One thing when we're adding wood, wood and of course we can't have that big chunk of wood lift up with water and float down to block a culvert. So we have to really work hard to make sure that they're cabled in um, and add big boulders. And so, you know, we can't make the stream a perfectly natural stream as it used to be. We have to work within those constraints in the urban environment, but we can still do a great job. And, um, you know, it's looking really beautiful right now. I'll show you a couple after photos in a sec here, but um, after the main in-stream work is completed, we bring in a, sort of an army of volunteers and have them help plant out the riparian zone. You can see them planting here. Um, and then some smaller tributaries, we help them even with in-stream work too. So just shoveling gravel into a stream to help create, recreate some spawning habitat. So just a couple before photos, this section of the stream was essentially a muddy ditch. There was no rock, um, a lot of garbage had accumulated, high erosion causing an undercut of these big trees. Normally that is good to see, but in a park, of course, you have to consider that um, you don't want big trees falling down on trails. Um, so uh, a lot of uh, opportunities to, to help improve this habitat. And just some after photos here, you can see we added in all this cobble and rock that re uh, creates a riffle, which is essentially allowing water to bubble over the rocks and help oxygenate the water, creates habitat for invertebrates. Uh, this middle photo is a big deep pool that we dug out, uh, which is really important with the uh, increasing drought conditions that we're experiencing here. So it creates a refuge for, for salmon to hide in. So it's looking quite beautiful now. Um, the riparian vegetation is slowly coming back. Um, and after a few months of, after the restoration was completed in August of 22, we saw some coho spawning in this section that we hadn't seen them before since there was no spawning gravel. Uh, so in the photo on the left here is some co a coho pear spawning. Um, and then the right shows uh, a red or a salmon nest. So this sort of patch of light gravel um, is where salmon had nested. So essentially they used their tails to dig out a nest and by doing that, they clean the gravel. So we can use that to, to try and find uh, areas of salmon activity during the fall spawning season. So really exciting to see um, this positive impact. However, we're still dealing with a lot of issues, particularly around water quality is a big, big one and difficult to manage when you're dealing with such a highly urbanized uh, watershed, but I'll I'll um, cover that in just a sec here again. Another um, project that we worked on um, is one of <clears throat> doing beach restoration. So this project was done in downtown Victoria Harbor, <clears throat> very small pocket beach. The photo on the left was the before. So essentially it was highly um, impacted, had large concrete chunks um, on the beach not a lot of um, habitat um, available or rec recreational use. Um, so we partnered with the city of Victoria, as well as the Songhees Nation to restore this. It's a very small beach, but has a lot of um, potential uh, to restore it for recreational use. Uh, Songhees Nation wanted an area where they could launch canoes as well as a forge fish spawning beach. So forge fish, similar to herring, um, but other species that we have here like to use the beach to spawn, but they need certain sediments, that smaller gravel and smaller sand as well, which the beach didn't have before. So this photo on the right shows the middle phase um, where we were able to remove those concrete blocks and replace it with uh, better sediment. And then moving into the final phase last year, this is the completed project. Um, beautiful sand beach with gravel and varying sizes of sediments. We planted out the back shore with um, shoreline specific species, including beach grass right on the beach and created a walkway that allows people to use the beach, including um, a spot to launch canoes from. And this being an important culture site for the Songhees, a totem pole went up as well. So it's a really beautiful site. And uh, we had seen some positive impacts from this as well. Uh, just a few weeks actually after completing that first phase when we removed that concrete, 
we saw um, surfs or found surf smelt eggs on the beach. So um, they we did some sampling and found these tiny little eggs in a spot where they wouldn't have been able to spawn before. So that was a pretty exciting find. And then of course, now we are seeing lots of people using the beach as it was meant to launching canoes and paddle boards and just a really great um, gathering spot for the community as well. Um, the last project I want to highlight is Rain Gardens. Um, we've launched a program recently in the last couple of years called Rain Gardens for Headwaters. And we are essentially trying to build as many rain gardens as we can. Um, they have a massive impact, uh, positive impact, and can be very easy and effective um, in um, filtering out contaminants before they hit the streams. So uh, a rain garden is essentially a landscaped area that collects and absorbs and filters storm water. So you can see in the photo there that little patch of grass or garden um, is, in, uh, is able to have the water drain from the parking lot into that garden where it can slowly soak into the ground and get filtered through, the, through that absorption process. Um, and we are working on partnering with uh, various groups and trying to build these rain gardens throughout the city. And a big one is working with schools. Um, and yeah, just a couple benefits for these rain gardens. You know, they can be they can be quite big and expensive, but they can also be very simple. Like even just removing one parking spot and putting in some uh, essentially mulch, dirt, and plants can make a difference in. Um, in filtering out contaminants, uh, mitigating against flooding, and then drought as well in terms that it can accumulate water and just overall creating that resilience for climate change. So as I mentioned, we're right now working with schools and building rain gardens on their campuses. Um, so this is just one example where we worked with a, an elementary school and had the kids um, get involved in learning about rain gardens and stormwater runoff and the issues around that. They helped us design the rain gardens and then plant them out as well, as well as maintaining them after, after completion. And um, yeah, it's a really great program. We've seen a lot of um, awesome excitement, you know, from the kids getting out um, and planting right on their school grounds. And then this just this small garden here has made a big difference in just the water pooling in removing the water pooling that was happening in this parking lot. So already seeing some benefits. Um, and yeah, just working on building more partnerships with schools and then districts as well, and municipalities to, to build more rain gardens. So I just wanted to highlight some of the successes that we have seen and briefly mention some challenges, but there are a lot of challenges working um, within an urban environment. Um, and one of the big ones is spatial constraints, of course. Uh, you know, we're often left to working within small pockets or corridors and sort of lacking that real connectivity of, um, of good quality habitat for biodiversity. Um, you know, trying to remove impervious surfaces and replanting is, is a real challenge. And for that, we need, you know, social acceptance and participation and that real buy-in. Um, and, you know, we often run into the issue of landowners, particularly around shorelines and streams, too, that may not necessarily understand what's happening and may not want any work being done around their properties. But, you know, education is a real big um, piece for this, is trying to educate people around the issues that may be in, in, may, will impact, I should say, their, the properties in the future with, clim with increasing climate change impacts. Of course, as a nonprofit, we're always running to funding constraints and challenges as well. We're constantly applying for grants and reporting that can decrease our capacity to do these projects. Policy and government governance, you know, we also really need that buy-in from municipalities and governmental bodies to protect these green spaces and water sources into the future and to particularly around water quality, you know, there's there's some things that we can do in terms of building rain gardens, but we need some major changes at the higher level as well. Um, and then of course, climate change, um, the unpredictable unpredictable impacts are can be quite difficult to, tr when we're designing a restoration project, you know, we try to think about what will happen and try and plan for those, like I mentioned, digging out those deeper pools in the stream, but 
we don't really know exactly what's going to happen. So designing for unknown can be very challenging, but we're trying. <laughs> um, so with that, I just wanted to say a couple of thank yous. So to the First Nation partners that we are working with, um, Big Piece is trying to incorporate more um, traditional knowledge into our restoration designs. And i um, really excited to, to be, continue fostering these relationships. And then of course, with our um, municipal partners and governmental partners as well, um, definitely, um, yeah, really, really thankful that we can work closely with these municipalities across Greater Victoria. And that is it. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, yeah, I tried to make the settings so I could see the other folks because I imagine there'd be lots of this going on for both of you. It's uh, it's a great presentation. Yeah, and I like I, when we first met and you were telling me about you know the well the connection with the First Nations that really stood out with me. But then also, you know, as you were saying the way, you know, the volunteers helping you restore the stream and, and you're saying how you do it in the, you know, when the water levels are low, so you're not doing any impact, but then as the water levels increase, like you, you get to see that, uh, you know, the results of your work when you were saying, you know, about the 400, 500 coho and the, uh, and the, the forge fish. And so like, I, I've been working on climate now for almost 30 years and it's, not the most rewarding work when you, you know, I think I started, it was like 370 parts per million. Now we're at what, 419. So, but what, that's what I really like about, you know, the work that you're both doing, like you, you get to see positive results and, you know, especially where the younger people now with climate anxiety and, and the eco anxiety, like, you know, to be able to, to get dirty with you in the streams and to, you know, help to restore these types of things and to learn and to, you know, to really feel like you're making an impact at your local level instead of this big grandiose like these climate cops and things like that where it's just a bunch of talking heads for the most part but uh <laughs> not that I... yeah and, and so okay so I, so I see we have five questions right now so i'm going to go so the first question from penny nelson is and this one looks like it's more for you michelle is gibson's using proprietary software or is this something that's available off the shelf um, that's an interesting question. So the uh, if we're talking about for modeling, which I'm assuming that's the software you're meaning, um, no, it's available off the shelf. But having said that, um, we Gibson's is working with a complex systems modeler named Matt Bass. He's out of the Victoria Esquimalt region. And um, we've been working with him for the last few years on developing a, um, a model that can look at the impacts of climate change, all of these different stressors um, at the same time. So typically models right now, like I said, we had this uh, stormwater model that can look at stormwater. So you could look at precipitation events, um, like specific things. Same with the aquifer model, we can uh, create scenarios and say, what if there's a one meter or 0.5 meter uh, rise in sea level, what would that do to the, or or we have a decrease in precipitation, um, what would that do for recharge? But we couldn't couple the two together. And so the model that we're building, um, we are, we applied for a grant to support that work. And this model will be looking at doing risk assessments and policy assessments to see impacts of, you know, if you were to change this one component of your system and the system being your watershed or your community, uh, what would the impacts be or what what would the outputs be um, on all the other components of the system? So we're probably a year out from having the initial working model, um, but it will be available. We're, we're gonna work with the province of BC and uh, it would be free for municipalities to use it's something that we're going to use like pilot and gibsons um <clears throat> and with surrounding areas but then it'll be available for use outside of that so hopefully that answered your question yeah I, that's one thing i can't get the the back and forth um so but i think so and and if you don't mind like if i could share your contact information uh of course later yeah. just to, to continue this um so the next one is diane moran 
uh, how can other towns and other communities have this assessment done? This is so important, and our tiny town of Wallacombe Beach would greatly benefit. Anyone? <laughs> Is it more like, is that the natural asset initiative? Like looking at where they're doing their, you know, they're doing their assessments, their inventories and figuring out the, the first step? Yeah, it, I am not quite sure on the question. If we're talking about an assessment of a creek, then Katrina can answer that one. If we're talking about assessment of I think uh, it natural came, assets inventory. I think it, it actually came in, I'm just looking at the timestamp. It came in when you were presenting, Michelle. So I think it's okay. more, unless you have anything to add as well, Katrina, I actually have something to add as well. So we all. Okay, want. great. So as far as the assessment done, if we're talking about uh, like the natural asset <clears throat> project that we're doing at the watershed scale, this is something, there's a couple of resources um, that have just recently come out and it's through the natural assets initiative. So if you go onto their website, um, you'll find all the resources there. But there was also uh, a CSA standard that was just produced for natural for for doing natural asset inventories. Um, so that is on like the CSA standards website. You can download it for I think it's fifty dollars. But that's um, that's pretty much your first step. Um, you can also contact Natural Assets Initiative. Um, they do like expressions of interest or calls to see if people are wanting to undertake this project and they um, they support you through that. So natural asset side of it, yes, that's the answer there. Trina, do you have anything to add? Um, I think she was talking about natural asset, but if it's stream restoration uh, or stream, stream assessment, sorry, um, yeah, for smaller, it, it can be tricky in smaller areas when there may not be these larger groups working in there. But, uh, you know, on BC anyway, reaching out to the Pacific Stream Keepers Federation, um, they can often link you as a smaller group. Uh, if you are in a, in a volunteer group, they can link you with folks that can help out in um, doing a stream assessment or pointing you in the direction of applying for funding to hire someone to do the stream assessment. So the the Pacific Stream Keepers Federation um, is a great resource to use and they can sort of link you up with um, with various groups. Also, if you're on the island as Qualicum Beach, you can uh, reach out to me as well. I know a few folks that do stream assessments, so I can point you in the right direction as well. <laughs> Thank you. And Diane, I, you know, I'm happy to uh, chat with you as well, because if it's at the real beginning stages, uh, you know, that's where we can, you know, I could do some research on the community and see if they have a climate plan and and just to see where, you know, if it has is in the municipal official plan, then how we can build out on that. So, uh, you know, I'd love to be able to work. Actually, she actually has another question. Um, love the partnerships with schools and volunteer groups. Great projects. Are there provincial and local grants available? Smaller communities lack the resources, but do the not the need to have these projects. Um, so yeah, you're shaking your head, Katrina. Um, yeah, so local grants for sure. A big one, of course, is the Pacific Salmon Foundation. They give a lot of funding out to groups doing restoration projects. Um, and the community salmon program of of PSF, um, you know, that's a really key grant for a lot of groups to do this kind of work. And there are definitely federal or sorry, provincial grants as well. Um, they're a lot often a little bit bigger and a bit more onerous in terms of onerous in terms of applying for them. Um, for the island, I there are like often when we're looking for funding from municipalities, we have grants and aids, and that's kind of like that municipal level funding. Um, but yeah, I would say for smaller communities, you know, the PSF is probably one of the best uh, funding sources. And there's other ones too. I'm sorry, I can't name them all, but you can reach out to me and I can uh, help you um, point you in the direction as well. And yep. I, I will answer Christina's <clears throat> question that came in on the, the funding for the $6 million stream restoration. That was through UBCM. <clears throat> I'm not sure what organization you're with Christina, but this is the University of British Columbia Municipalities or Union Union of British Columbia Municipalities. Uh, and it was the 
Canadian Community Building Fund, the Strategic Priorities Fund. And I know the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, they have the Green yeah. Municipal Fund, and they are now looking more and more into this. So I'm hoping that that's going to be, you know, part of their green infrastructure offering. Okay, so then uh, from Charles Schulman, uh, thanks for the presentation. Are you able to share the cost of the stream and beach restoration projects in Victoria? Um, yeah, for the stream projects, um, like it's it's a little tricky because uh, we share the the resources with the municipality, so they would bring in they would have their labor and machines machinery essentially. Um, I don't know exactly how much they had put into it, but I roughly estimate around so that one Copley project that I worked on would approximately be about one hundred fifty to two hundred thousand um, dollars. Sort of shared resources um, with. Our funding that we received grants for, and then a bulk, of, most of the bulk of the cost from uh, the District of Saanich as well. I'm just not privy to all their numbers. Um, the beach restoration, unfortunately, I was not the leader on that one, so we don't know the full funding for that one. Um, but uh, if if I can also get those costs um, and potentially email them as well, if I if I can get them. <laughs> Sorry. No, I think that's very helpful. Uh, this person has a funny name, anonymous attendee. Sorry, bad joke. Uh, thanks for the great presentation and keep up uh, the good work. Thank you for that. And so Candace Savage has a question. Do you have metrics on nature-based impacts that can be included in reporting and tracking GHG trends at the municipal level? Sounds like Michelle's uh -huh. question. Yeah, that, that's a that's a hard one. Um, and I think maybe I'll kind of break down the question. So reporting and tracking GHG trends. Um, we are just undertaking a corporate climate action plan and a community like energy and emissions plans um, kind of back to back right now. Um, because, well, there's a lot involved in this, but because we're a municipality less than 10,000, we're actually less than 5,000, we don't have to do our reporting. Um, hmm. We're not mandated to do it in BC, but we choose to do it regardless. Um, so I'm trying to think nature-based impacts that could be included. Um, I would have to say no, but another piece to this is we're doing an urban forest plan right now as well. And so through that work, we're trying to link the two, like the, because we're kind of looking at mitigation and adaptation through these, this reporting and the urban forest plan and our natural asset work. And um, it's, unless we're, it depends on what we're, what approach we would use and um we're not looking at uh, essentially carbon carbon credits or anything like that because we're so small um yeah that i can't really answer that um i wish candace you were on the screen and i could have I know, you it's, it's tough that i could figure that <laughs> out for the, for the next webinar uh, I, kn I know that gibson's i believe is is a member of the partners for climate protection program yeah yeah, and then so that's there's, I think there's almost 500 municipalities part of that now, and I know yeah. they're doing you know the tracking of the GHG, but I don't know about the trend piece. The exactly. reporting is, but there, there's one group, uh, Candice, it's uh, Sustainability Solutions Group, uh, SSG. So if you Google Sustainability Solutions Group or SSG, I know they do a lot of uh, like setting trends and where they're going. So they like to have some case studies there on their website that I think, and feel free to reach out to uh, just P Gregory at naturecanada.ca and I can, you know, help see if I can help move this along uh, or answer your question. Uh, so Diane, thank you to you both for answering the questions. Uh, Carmel Thompson, I'm just looking at five minutes left. Uh, Michelle, Gibson's has been a trailblazer in valuing natural assets. Has Gibson's also valued natural assets on private land? And if so, how is this accomplished? Uh, yes, so through, through 
through that source of fee project that I was talking about when we did the valuation of all the assets, um, we did we did the stormwater valuation, which meant, like I said, if you were to remove trees um, or riparian vegetation in certain areas, what would the impacts be for stormwater? And then what size stormwater pond would you have to build to, um, to slow that water before it enters the creek system? Uh, and so that those properties are, or what we looked at within the urban forest area was uh, properties that are privately owned and not currently have been developed. So they're greenfield sites that we know will be slated for development based on land use planning and OCP plans. Um, so yes, for stormwater. And then the other piece to the source to see was we did a whole like sub um, project on co-benefits valuation. So we were we we weren't able to quantify the co-benefits because we're not there yet, or maybe we'll never be. But uh, we talked about the um, the value of, say, the riparian area for like cultural or um, education and science opportunities, or you know, like uh, carbon sequestration, like all these different things. But we weren't able to actually quantify. That was me. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't want to. Did you just make up a name? No, no. no. Oh. They, they had their hand raised. So I just realized oh, I that they Great. could ask a question this way instead of the chat box. So after okay. you finish answering, then I was going to let them uh, answer. Yeah. Yeah. Ask no, go Sorry. Ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Distraction. It's okay. Uh, just, yeah, ask to unmute. Brenda Mir, if, uh, if you can unmute to ask your question. Like you just spoke no, to sorry, I raised I raised a hand by mistake. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I okay, well, I've, I've learned you can do this now. Okay, so it looks like we have two more questions, like time. Uh, so this is from Deb Jack. Well, will the new legislation of BC rehousing prevent this from being done? Uh, E.G. Surrey Council just decided to reduce the OCP repairing setback provisions to the minimum provincial standards to facilitate developers speeding up the application process. Um, at a municipal level right now, that's not impacting the town of Gibson's. Okay. Katrina may be able to talk about that in a larger setting. Um, sorry, I don't think I quite understand the question of preventing what is being done. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, the new legislation of BC rehousing prevent this being done. Maybe it was a part of this question above. Um, maybe it was, maybe they could be able to clarify. Yeah, maybe if they could clarify, Deb. Uh, just, you know, in the question again, That's and then right. I'll go to this last question. Uh, we are not for profit, and so this is from... Uh, uh, Jean McWright, um, we are not a we are not for profit Mississauga based organization in the Western uh, GTA, Greater Toronto Area, uh, Lake Erie lowland region with the watersheds and habitats severely impacted by urban intensification. We face many daunting challenges, including municipal priorities and huge competition for funding support. Uh, any advice for us? That's a good question. And I'm sure lots of groups are feeling that. Um, yeah, it's it's funding. Um, the lack of funding and the competition is also something that we deal with here, too. And um, I think one one piece of advice, I guess, uh, would be to build those partnerships and potentially, you know, reach out to other groups that are doing similar work. Um, see if there's a way to combine forces and resources um, that are that are working towards the same similar goal, um, you know, looking at potentially reaching out to municipal um, partners and see if there's that opportunity um, of building that relationship. Um, you know, just also getting out into the community and just raising your profile in terms of um, uh, you know getting volunteers um, that are excited about your cause. Um, that could be something too, but. Yeah, it's it's certainly difficult um, when there's you know a lot of groups look, working 
towards the same funding pot. It can be it can be very tricky. Yeah, sorry. I hope I hope that helps a little bit. <laughs> and, and I'm you know, I'm here to help uh, Jan as well. So you know, happy to continue this conversation afterwards. Uh, to you know, see where I can assist, and uh, I think there is going to be more and more money coming because, like I was saying before in previous webinars, like biodiversity seems to be you know starting to gain more and more traction. I'm noticing maybe that's just more here in Ottawa, and you know, just that people are talking about it. You know, yourselves who've been in the trenches for a very long time, it's uh, you know, you understand it. But with I guess I say that because I think there will start to be more and more funding towards, it, especially where we're making those linkages between climate and biodiversity uh, and you know just to show and especially with the liabilities in the extreme weather events anyway we're over time by one minute so again i really want to uh you know thank michelle and, and katrina for you know I, I thought this was awesome and um uh, you know this this is continuing this this webinar series and more solutions like it's it's exciting to you know to hear from the folks doing the work and i thank you both for you know, taking an hour out of your time and the time for prepping and doing all this so uh Greatly appreciate it. Like I said, I'll be sending out a follow-up survey and it'll have also the, the the three recordings now. So I'll put this one up on YouTube. So you'll be able to, you know, share. And if you could fill out the survey, it definitely helps. It's just an internal thing within, you know, a few staff here uh, just to help, you know, better improve these. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this. And um, yeah, thank you again for participating and taking time out of your busy schedules to attend. And I hope you learned something. And, and I want to continue this uh, relationship so that we can move these things forward and have more success stories. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye Thanks. for now.